The Unshackled Waves, Episode 84. Broadcasting from Melbourne, Australia, this is The Unshackled Waves with Tim Wills. Brought to you by theunshackled.net. Hello everyone, great to have your company. We've got another report show coming up. Uh, This time it'll be on the verdict of the trial of the Bendigo 3 in Melbourne that happened this week. Uh, Both myself and associate editor of The Unshackled, Tom Peroni, were present on the first day of the trial. So we thought we'd get together to discuss the trial, uh, the verdict and its implications. So let's get straight to it. Back to the show. Thanks for having me, Tim. Uh, now, we thought uh, since we were both present on day one of the trial of the Bendigo 3 that we would do uh, a special show to uh, explore the uh, trial verdict and uh, ramifications of it in full. So, obviously, it was a disappointing result for uh, free speech. The the Bendigo 3, which is made up of Blair Cottrell, uh, who is leader of the United Patriots Front, uh, and Neil Erickson and uh, Chris Sh- uh, Shortis, uh, they were all found guilty under Victoria's Racial and Religious Tolerance Act of uh, inciting serious contempt or ridicule of Muslims for their 2015 mock beheading video, which they performed uh, in Bendigo. It was to promote the their rally at the time to uh, stop the construction of the, the Bendigo Mosque. Now, there's a lot of uh, facts to discuss and and unlike the uh, you know mainstream media, we w- we want to make sure we bring you uh, the truth about the the facts of this case and and what the what the verdict means. But we might start with the uh, the video itself, uh, which involved it was a, it was a they used a, a dummy uh, to perform the beheading, and it was uh, they, it was quite elaborate because when they beheaded the the dummy like. Uh, red liquid uh, poured out. So it was designed to be graphic. And the reason they performed this uh, beheading is because they, they wanted to make the point that, you know, if you have more Islamis- Islamization of Australia, you know, this is what you're, you know, uh, potentially uh, bringing in, obviously. Uh, it's not just performed by Islamic State uh, beheadings, but also by, you know, uh, uh, Islamic uh, regimes such as Saudi Arabia. Yeah, uh, well, look, to be honest with you, I don't personally agree with the um, the way in which they went about expressing their message. So I thought that the video in itself might have been perhaps a little bit controversial. Having said that, though, I understand that they were doing it with the, uh, you know, the explicit intention to obviously draw attention towards their cause. Um, and obviously they were able to achieve that. As to the response of the government, all you've seen here is a dangerous legal precedent has been now established in Victoria where we essentially have... Um, blasphemy laws, more or less. Um, Obviously, you know, based on the idea of case law, we now have, uh, you know, potential um, future cases where the prosecution could argue that based on this legal precedent, which has been set, we can now essentially be um, stripped of our rights to free speech and more or less charged and punished for speaking out against a particular ideology. Now, I mean, I personally, um, you know, I don't agree with 18C, obviously, but I, I think... Um, the arguments in support of this particular law are far more convincing when it's made from a racial perspective. Um, I mean, I personally consider um, you know, racial discrimination to be morally abhorrent, but if someone is going to be discriminating on the basis of an ideology, I think that we as a democratic society should be open to that right. And I think the fact that that has now been stripped away from us is very dangerous, and it's definitely something that we should be avoiding. Um, not only that, I, I also think that the double standard that we've seen established here, whereby certain ideologies can't be criticized and yet um you know particular other ideologies are you know it's open season more or less um i don't know about you tim but i i've noticed in my own personal experiences that um, a religion like say christianity it's very trendy and fashionable these days for certain people to criticize um, that particular religion and yet if people criticize a book which you know calls beheadings and whatever else then um you know you can essentially end up with a two thousand dollar fine as we've seen happen during the week unfortunately yeah, uh, I've, I mean, no religion 
is you know above criticism or you know should be free from you know ridicule i mean at the at the end of the day our religion is still you know a, an ideology and you know where you know we have a right in a in a free society to question it and you're right there's a double standard i mean you know christianity is you know mocked for probably almost daily by uh, Austra australian comedians but uh there's under it's interesting under this uh racial and religious tolerance act which has uh been in place in victoria since 2002 the uh this is the the second major uh prosecution under under that law the the first victims of this law were uh two pastors from the catch the fire ministries uh daniel scott and denny nalia who gave a sermon calling islam a uh, a violent uh, religion they were they were taken to to vcat uh, uh, they took it they took this uh, they were found uh, in breach of it but they you know they fought this all the way and uh, it got overturned on the the court of appeal but they had to go through basically the entire uh, Victorian legal apparatus so as is always the case with this the the, the punishment is the crime now uh, they were found uh, the Bendigo three they were found guilty at the the Melbourne Magistrates Court and they have said that they'll appeal so this isn't the uh, the end of it but yeah it's and obviously people people will say that you know you can criticize you know like I Islam but you know they're making that you know video that was you know beyond the pale but as was pointed out by uh, Mark Latham and uh, Neil Erickson on the day that you know Kathy Griffin she you know beheads uh, does a mock beheading of you know Donald Trump and she was doing it because she hated Trump and wished that would happen to him while this beheading was was in, enacted because you know they were as a warning like we don't like this we're showing you you know what could happen so Kathy Griffin's beheading was you know much worse because it was you know this is what she fantasized about basically and she's being led into uh, Australia to do her uh, ironically titled laughing your head off world tour yet you know she you know her, her career is like uh, back on track yet uh, these three they've you know been fined two thousand dollars each uh, Blair Cottrell he got a conviction recorded against him so yeah there that's another double standard yeah, so just um, in relation to what you mentioned before in regards to the, uh, the Danny Nalia case, so the impression I was under is that um, after they appealed the decision, the conviction was overturned. And in fact, I think that the Victorian Islamic Council had to foot um, for yeah, a the significant of portion of the bill. Yeah, the court overturned. Yeah. yeah, so I understand that would mean, like, as a result of that uh, decision, the legal precedent would no longer exist. Would I be correct in saying that? Yeah, that was a obviously something that they they said. While well, while well, this charge yeah. is about uh, something that the the Bendigo Three did, uh, the fact that we now have this uh, legal precedent established in Victoria, it does set a a very um, you know a very dangerous standard, um, as we can see. And now I think uh, the idea of you know freedom of speech is very much under threat. And I think that um, many of the principles upon which Western civilization and Australia specifically were founded are now very much, um, I think, being questioned by this, uh, this new establishment that we're seeing rising up over the last 10, 15 years or so. And it's not only a ref uh, reflection in popular culture and the media, we're also seeing um, in many cases, and in fact, we, as we saw during the week, that even the courts are coming, uh, becoming largely politicized, which I think sets a, sets a very dangerous precedent there when you're seeing even the uh, judicial arm of government has also, uh, you know, fallen victim to this, um, you know, this cultural shift that we're seeing happen. And, and it should also be emphasised that uh, uh, this uh, action were, was taken by the Victorian government, uh, uh, by the Director of Public Prosecution. So no Muslim actually took a, took offence and decided to take this action. It was at the behest of you know the Victorian government, which is they they basically took offence on you know Muslims' behalf, and that's probably scary in itself that the government decided to make an example of these three, saying you know you you know can't criticise Islam in this way. We're going to you know uh, uh, put you on trial to you know send this message and basically have a a chilling effect throughout the community. Yeah, well, obviously these three were used as a scapegoat. Essentially, I think it's very much this idea of wanting to send a message out to the general public, 
you know, if you don't play by our rules, then this is what happens to you. Um, so it very much is a, a bullying tactic that, we, that we've seen here. Um, interestingly, I, based on my understanding, I don't think Daniel Andrews has actually come out on the record and actually commented on the case. I might be wrong in saying that. Are you, are you aware of any evidence to the contrary? No, I've, I can't comment on that. Yeah. Um, so, you know, yeah, based on my understanding, Daniel Andrews hasn't actually commented publicly on the case. Um, but I, I just find that so bizarre that, yeah, as you said, it's the government that's actually pursuing this action against these men. And, um, you know, the uh, supposed victims of the incident itself, um, you know, the Muslim community of Victoria or even of Australia more broadly, haven't actually pressed any charges. Uh, let's uh, let's also remember that Daniel Andrews has got his uh, anti-racism thought police, which he announced earlier this year to you know crack down on you know uh, far right racist propaganda. So you know this is probably just another extension of you know what, of what he wants to you know try and uh, uh, the ideas that he wants to promote. Yes, well that as well. Obviously, the man has an agenda. Um, he's you know he's tried. Uh, in various different capacities to force this on the Victorian people, whether it be through the Safe Schools program or um, with the uh, you know the enforcement of these laws, as we've mentioned, clearly he's got a very um, radical agenda which he's trying to enforce. And I, quite frankly, I don't think that this next state election can come soon enough. I think the people need to have their voices heard, and uh, they need to vote out the the dangerous agenda being pursued by the Andrews government. Well, I was uh, there present uh, uh, before the, the trial began. This was on uh, Monday, the, the 4th of September, 2017. Uh, so uh, this was uh, the, the three, uh, the Bendigo three, they, they entered the court there and there was, of course, as uh, always happens, where whenever these uh, patri uh, patriots appear in public, there was a leftist uh, counter-protest. It was organised by the Campaign Against uh, Racism and Fascism, which is a collection of uh, socialist groups. And, uh, of, co of, uh, of course, you know, they said that, you know, oh, these, you know, Nazis are on trial for their racism. Their chant was, you know, no Nazis, never again. Uh, they had plenty of um, supporters, the, the Bendigo Three. So um, uh, the, the support was actually led by, Neil Erickson himself, he appeared with Trump hat and uh, a megaphone and he like, ran, uh, and I've got a video of this which is on the Unshackled YouTube channel, uh, Neil Erickson, he dramatically runs up and, you know, start, start shouting in their face and, uh, yeah, then, and then obviously the police separate the, the, uh, the people and <laughs> Neil Erickson's, uh, you know, chant back to them was, get a job, get a job. <laughs> Yeah, no, I mean, I, I saw the footage, um, you know, obviously Neil likes to stir the pot and he did a good job of that on Monday. Having said that, though, I think that the presence of these so-called protesters is just completely unnecessary. They've obviously just appeared there for the sake of, um, you know, virtue signaling and trying to perform some sort of a media stunt. Um, but yeah, I, I, I just, I can't understand what their thought process was, what exactly it was that they wanted to achieve by appearing at this particular event. It was it was interesting uh, later on when uh, all all of the the supporters had gone into the courtroom. The and I didn't have time to include this on the video, but the the socialists they were celebrating that there were not many supporters there, though, which which basically they interpret as as is our intimidation and thuggery has you know deterred people from you know showing support, which is you know quite or quite disturbing that there would have been you know many people who you know would want to you know show their you know support for these patriots and free speech, yet are obviously scared of. You know what the uh, you know what these socialists the the confrontations that they they bring and you know if the police weren't there they you know assault uh, try and assault people. Yeah, well, as you say, um, you know, obviously their their prime uh, motivator is to you know spread violence and fear. Um, but yeah, thank God that the police were there to prevent um, you know a violent incident from break, uh, breaking out at the event. But I think it really is only just a matter of time until we see. Um, an event like this eventually lead to something far more sinister, potentially. Now, obviously, uh, Arby Yemeni is going to be having an event on, I think, the 17th of September, somewhere thereabouts, um, a, a political protest in the Melbourne CBD. 
I'm sure that this same crowd is going to be present at that event. And as I said, it's only a matter of time until, um, you know, violence or something even worse potentially breaks out. Yeah, oh, they, they said uh, at, the, at the conclusion of their rally that they're going to be uh, at, at that rally as well. So uh, okay. they, 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 they make an effort to, you know, go to, you know, anything that has a, a tinge of, you know, uh, right wing conservative or nationalism to it and, you know, provoke this. And the mainstream media, of course, they, they report this saying, oh, there were clashes here. Well, there's only a clash because the leftist counter, counter protesters show up. Yeah, well, exactly. Fake news, right? Um, they, they'll just do anything for a story. Um, I mean, obviously, anyone who was there on the day would have seen that it was only one particular side who was inciting violence. And yet, nonetheless, everything that we saw from the mainstream media was trying to push an entirely different narrative. Now, as you said, they are obviously going to be present at this event. Um, coming up on, as I said, September 17th or somewhere thereabouts. You'd have to check the Facebook event to confirm. But I would encourage any of our viewers to, um, if they can, if possible, uh, make it to this event and, you know, show these guys that you're not going to be intimidated into silence and you're not going to be, um, you know, forced into into hiding your um, political opinions. Uh, an interesting side that there was one of the, the nationalists I'm friends with on Facebook posted a, a photo of one of these uh, uh, socialists that were holding up their, you know, no Nazi sign. And it's this really, you know, puny, skinny guy. And like all the comments are like, you know, that's who we're, you know, afraid of. How are like, a, you know, people, you know, men who <laughs> look like that, you know, basically terrorizing Melbourne. Yeah, actually, I, I think I, um, I might have seen the same image that you did. Um, yeah, obviously, this guy wasn't exactly the most menacing character. Um, but I think that, that when they do get together in a crowd, they sort of get this, um, you know, this exaggerated um, perception of self where they, they suddenly think that they're, you know, six feet tall and, uh, you know, 200 kilos. Um, but as you say, I think most of them on their own, they're usually just scrawny little 20-year-old uni students. So it's nothing to fear, I don't think. And it's, uh, I can't believe there's some people who, like, because obviously I mentioned before that Neil Erickson, like, he made a very dramatic entrance that, you know, oh, he was deliberately trying to, you know, provoke an incident with the the so uh, the, the socialist uh, crowd. But, you know, that that's basically saying that, oh, you know, you, sh you shouldn't uh, antag uh, antagonise them uh, because otherwise they'll turn violent, which is basically, you know, be nice to these socialists, otherwise they'll turn violent, which is exactly the the, you know, wrong mind frame. That's, that's the same thing as, you know, be nice to, you know, Muslims or they'll all they'll attack us. I mean, you know, yeah. provocation is, is not a just, a, you know, doesn't excuse a crime. Yeah, well, it does reek of uh, victim blaming, doesn't it? Obviously, Neil was just there to, you know, have his day in court. And I don't think it's really right that a man who was obviously already in a very stressful situation was then made to feel even um, greater pressure as a result of having you know, a few dozen so-called protesters there to harass him on his way into court. Um, but no, good luck to him, I think. And the fact that he was willing to stand up to these people and, um, you know, make a bit of a, a joke out of their presence, I thought it was fantastic. So good on him, I think. And while he was in Melbourne for the trial, he decided to uh, gate crash a Yarra City Council meeting on the the Tuesday night. Uh, the 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 people that were with him, uh, based on the signs, they appeared to be associated with the the Party for Freedom, which is probably the best, uh, dare I say, trollish nationalist group in it in Australia with some of their hilarious signs. So uh, they they went into the chamber with the. Uh, a chance, you know, Aussie Pride nationwide, and uh, most most of their um, abuse was directed at uh, Councillor Stephen Jolly, who's well known Melbourne socialist. Because of course, for those who don't know Yarra City Council, they basically started this chain reaction of uh, councils voting to cancel Australia Day. Uh, now Stephen Jolly was like, "How dare they uh, disrupt a you know democratic meeting?" Which is of course a bit rich because you know we saw you know refugee advocates you know shut down. Uh, the federal parliament you know, uh, at the end of last year. Uh, so, you know, my attitude these days is, you know, give the left uh, a bit of a taste of their own medicine and, yeah, like, uh, let's see how they like, you know, their inner city council meetings being, being disrupted. Yeah, well, you raise a valid point there. I mean, I think we've been, uh, you know, taking a, a knife to a gunfight for far too many years. You know, we've got to start um, 
you know, fighting them using their own their own weapons and their own strategies. And I think the fact that these people were willing to go to that much effort and actually crash this meeting is fantastic because it's exactly the sort of uh, tactics and the ex exact same sort of frame of mind that you've been seeing from the left for so long. So it's it's about time they got a taste of their own medicine, as far as I'm concerned. Now let's talk, uh, talk a bit about the defence that the the three put up, and they. They said that how can we be prosecuted because we're basically mocking a an act which is illegal in Australia. They said that you know beheadings are not legal in Victoria, so we're basically the government's prosecuting us for uh, aff aff offending people uh, by saying that you know beheadings are wrong. And they also made the point that why would a Muslim be offended by this? If they're because uh, the government's basically saying that beheadings are part of Islam. Yeah, no, you you do raise a valid point there. Um, I'm I personally am not a, a you know a legal expert or anything like that, but I think that the um, the legal defence asserted by um, by the Bendigo Three was obviously very solid. Yeah, and uh, obviously we've talked a bit about the the consequences of the decision and it's yeah it's it's probably like obviously people like us are not deterred but there's certainly uh, a lot of people who will see this verdict and be you know even more hesitant now to you know raise concerns about Islam you know criticize Islam because look at look at what's happened to th these three they've gone through uh, you know this ordeal through the courts are hanging over their head for you know what is it uh, over a year now um, so yeah so it's as is always the the case with these uh, these types of anti free speech laws the the, the chilling effect and uh, especially because uh, the, this issue, you know, Islam in Australia, it's it's of concern to a, a lot of people, and uh, uh, the politicians, uh, they're they're obviously well, you know, the Victorian government at least, but also the federal government, they seem you know more interested in appeasing Islam and shutting down uh, any uh, any dissent or any objections or any questioning of it. Yeah, so obviously there is a uh, political agenda being pursued there. Uh, now, the fact that they are feeling the need to, um, you know, pursue this ag agenda in the name of, you know, equality and fairness and inclusion and whatever else, I think it's just thoroughly misleading. Uh, obviously, opposing an ideology and engaging in reasonable, you know, speech attached to that uh, criticism, I think is, you know, it's, it's what Western civilization is all, all about. It's what it means to live in a liberal democracy. So questioning that really does set a very dangerous precedent. Yeah. And it's like, well, what, what does it mean for, you know, people who, you know, criticise Islam on a regular basis? Well, now that they've, you know, been able to prosecute these three, will they go after, you know, an even bigger fish such as, um, you know, Pauline Hanson? Uh, the ACT now has their own uh, bl uh, blasphemy law. I mean, this result basically, you know, empowers the authorities to, to, to basically go after, you know, people they de deem Islamophobic. Yeah, you know, even I think Tony Abbott a few years ago made a comment about the need for um, reformation within Islam. So I mean, if if you really did, you know, take this um, this argument to its logical extent, I think there would be so many people who'd be negatively affected by it. And of course, the the media reaction to this uh, decision has uh, also been uh, disappointing, uh, and I was especially disappointed with the. Um, a reaction to it from you know so-called uh, so-called conservative uh, commentators. Uh, Paul Murray only briefly mentioned it when it happened on Tuesday night, and he was pretty uh, you know disparaging towards the Bendigo Three. And Andrew Bolt was uh, pretty silent on it as well. And I think that's because they considered the three of them to be uh, you know to uh, on the far right to defend, which which is quite which. Uh, these people, they're supposed to be for free speech for everybody. And just because, you know, these three are, you know, further right than, than you are, that doesn't mean you still shouldn't defend their right to free speech. Yeah, well, look, I'm personally, I'm a big fan of Paul Murray and Andrew Bolt, but I do think they have dropped the ball um, in this particular situation. Now, as you say, obviously, they, they do sort of, um, you know, uh, push across this image of them, uh, you know, being defenders of free speech. So I think if you are going to uh, take on that role, you've got to extend it to everyone, even those who you might not necessarily agree with. Uh, now, what we saw here was three men, you know, criticising an ideology, even if they were doing it in a somewhat crass way. 
I think that Andrew Bolt and Paul Murray, in order to uh, maintain ideological consistency, really should be going into bat for these three men. Uh, well, it's probably because uh, Chris Shortis, uh, you know, does admit to being a you know white nationalist, which is uh, yeah, which uh, he um, says there's a difference between being a white nationalist and being a, a racist and a Nazi. And I tend to agree there's a difference between white nationalism and uh, obviously Nazism. But I don't agree with you know white nationalism. But I still think that you know he has a right to his opinion and he shouldn't be hauled uh, hauled through the court. And um, Blair, Blair Cottrell, I'm you know pretty sure you know is of the the same view when it comes to you know um white nationalism so i think um you know i don't agree with you know everything they stand for but i'm still defending them yeah no exactly you don't necessarily have to uh, agree with the person's ideology uh, in fact i'm i'm just trying to remember that uh, that voltaire quote about um what is it where i i don't agree with what you say but i'll defend uh, to the death your right to say it or something along those lines and I really think that a quote like that rings true in a situation like this. You don't necessarily have to agree with the specific words that were said by the Bendigo Three, um, but nonetheless, the uh, the underlying principles there, the defence of free speech, I think, still needs to be upheld at all costs. Well, it was good to see that uh, Abi Yemeni he he showed. Um, uh, you know, solidarity with with them. He showed up on uh, Monday afternoon. He did a uh, a live uh, interview with uh, Neil uh, Neil Erickson. So clearly, he thought that you know this was important. And of course, you know, Avi Yemeni, he's uh, you know Jewish. He's you know unashamed uh, Zionist. I mean, he hates Nazis. I mean, he he's his language against the the Charlottesville rally was, you know, pretty strong. And, you know, if, if he thinks that, you know, these three are, you know, worthy of defending, then they're, they're, they're you know, probably not as extreme as the, the media paints them to be. Yeah, well, I, I understand that um, Neil Erickson, despite his controversial past, is now um, reformed in his view. So he's, um, he's obviously still of the conservative leaning, but he's no longer uh, associated with the, you know, the anti-Semitism and all that. Um, and I think if someone like Avi Yemeni, who's obviously Jewish, is able to forgive this man, then I think you know, that obviously speaks volumes. In, in fact, I was watching a uh, an interview on Yabi's uh, on Arby's Facebook page where it was um, him and Neil speaking following the court case. Uh, really interesting stuff. I would recommend uh, our viewers if they get the chance to check it out on on Arby's, uh, Facebook page. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, definitely. I, I think that the the media as a whole is, you know, uh, uh, dropped the ball on this, and it's it, it has like this should be. It, it's in my opinion, you know, the biggest attack on you know free speech. Yeah, yeah, it's you know, it's it's not on the you know the front page of you know the Australian or you know the uh, you know most talked about thing on uh, talkback radio. It's just that you know uh, uh, these people are because you know they're. Know, a bit a bit more extreme of you know let, let's just you know not touch that I mean that's basically sort of saying that the leftist characterization of them is effective and all the the left have to do is call someone a Nazi you know uh, enough times and then suddenly they are deemed so by everybody yeah well look I um, I wasn't exactly thrilled with how the uh, the media um, portrayed the incident. Having said that, though, the Australian did actually write up a, a very fair story, I thought, that did really um, give proper coverage of the issue. So it might not have been on the front page, but uh, credit where it's due, the Australian did give fair coverage for this particular incident. But, but I definitely think, I mean, there's obviously, uh, you know, 18C you know, gets the the most attention, obviously, with the 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 QUT case. But yeah, definitely, like there's there's so many other insidious pieces of legislation against free speech in Australia, and this one, the Racial and Religious Tolerance Act, it's uh, it, it's definitely even worse than 18C because, as you said, it covers you know religion as well, basically you know ideology, and I think there has been too much emphasis on, you know, 18C when there's, you know, all these other laws that uh, are causing great, uh, great damage to, you know, liberty in this country. Yeah, well, as you say, I think that that does overstep the mark where they want to uh, legislate for, um, you know, preventing speech against a particular ideology. Now, as I mentioned before, you know, even though I don't support 18C, I would be more 
open to a, um, I suppose, a restriction on hate speech on the basis of race. But I think that criticizing an ideology, I, uh, yeah, no, I, I think that's fundamental to living in a liberal democracy. So once you take that away, you know, what's next? Democracy, I suppose, would be the next thing to be taken away from us. Well, uh, this um, issue isn't over yet because, as I said, the, the three have uh, uh, you know, said they're going to appeal, so um, this will st still be uh, news in the future, so we'll definitely uh, keep following it because it is you know, an important uh, battle for free, uh, free speech. And uh, uh, thank you once again, Tom, for, for coming on the show and um, yeah, helping to, to give this report. Thanks for having me, Tim. My pleasure. And we do hope in future to cover more events in uh, not just Melbourne, but also in other cities as well. So, um, yeah, ho hopefully we can bring you more shows like this and, and more raw footage from on the ground. All right, everybody, that's the show for today. A reminder that I set off for New Zealand on Monday the 11th of September to cover that nation's general election, which is occurring on Saturday the 23rd of September 2017. I'll be bringing you interviews from candidates and activists, as well as some on-the-ground reports. And also, I'm getting closer to arranging an election night live stream between The Unshackled and our, our friends at Right Minds New Zealand, so hopefully I can confirm the details of that shortly. And of course, another event that we have coming up is that The Unshackled is sponsoring the first ever Liberty Fest conference in Brisbane on Saturday 14th of October 2017, which is hosted by our friends at Liberty Works. And also, supporters of The Unshackled can get a 20% discount on tickets by visiting libertyfest.org.au using the coupon code LFUNSHACK, all caps. Thanks once again for your company and we'll see you next time. Thanks for tuning in to The Unshackled Waves. Please visit theunshackledwaves.net for all the ways to subscribe and follow the show. Don't forget to pick up your free ebook at theunshackledbattlefield.net and keep checking out theunshackled.net for all the latest news and commentary.